Chapter 4 As they approached the end of the tunnel, they heard a strange, low humming noise. They also began to see, through the opening, flickering lights, some near, some far in the distance. When they reached the end and stood on the edge, staring out into the space beyond, they saw that their tunnel overlooked an enormous cavern of sorts. In fact, it was less like a cavern and more like an underground valley. As far as the eye could see, here on the tunnel side of the valley and there, climbing the steep side opposite them, and all the space in between, glittering lights in a variety of colors dotted the landscape. The lights came from homes, or from traveling inhabitants bearing lanterns, or from lamp posts lining narrow lanes paved with glimmering stone. But not all the traffic was on the ground. Much of it was in the air. The humming noise that they had heard was coming from several great white creatures which were tethered to a bar on the ledge three steps down from the tunnel mouth. There, they hovered patiently on flashing, translucent wings like enormous hummingbirds. Alamar led the travelers down the steps to stand before one of these majestic creatures. The head was like a horse's, only it was slenderer, and the mane, which was long and silky, flowed back from the crown of the head and from the cheekbones. Its eyes, surprisingly expressive for those of a beast, were spirited but calm. Its feet were like those of an owl or falcon, and its whole body, which was a bit longer than a horse's, glowed softly. A silver bridle was on its head, and it bore a double saddle. These are our Luminorn, our flying steeds, the creatures vital to our everyday lives and duties. My people have been masters of the Luminorn since time immemorial. The guards were already untying the reins of the Luminorn. One of them would hold the reins, while the other would mount, and then take the reins so that his companion could mount behind him. Soon, one of the guards was untying the creature nearest to Alamar and the travelers. The Lady Kent will ride with me, Alamar directed. Gerard, take the boy and the dog with you. Nori, you will take Lord Fields. Denmar, take Prince Ezra. I trust, Tooth Raptor, that you can keep up with the Luminorn. Kalon snorted, offended by the question. Watch me, young one. Alamar smiled. Very well. Now, let us be off. He helped Jane up into the back saddle of his Luminorn, where she took a firm grip of the saddle horn and looked nervously at the great beast's head. Then she looked down and felt her heart jump into her throat when she saw how far up they were. Alamar swung onto the saddle in front of her. Do not worry. He flies very smoothly. Hold on to me if you feel unsteady. To Jane's right, Jason climbed onto another guard's Luminorn. To her left, two guards attempted to lift Rocky. With a snarl, he bounded out of their arms, ran towards the Luminorn, and sprang nimbly onto its back, where he stood, calmly and steadily, between the saddles. Rossley shrugged at the guard and climbed on behind his dog. Ezra was now ready as well, and with a command from Alamar, the whole team swept out over the valley. It was a wonderful flight, riding on the backs of those magnificent, glowing beasts. Alamar was right. Their movements were smooth and graceful, without any sudden jerks or swerving. Their wings hummed deeply and vibrated their whole bodies gently as they glided along. Jane was so comfortable that she might have gone to sleep if it hadn't been for the awe-inspiring view, as well as the almost intimidating attractiveness of her flying partner. They steered toward the craggy opening at the far end of the valley, the glittering home lights slipping swiftly from under them. When they emerged from the valley, a whole new sight met their eyes. In various places on the vast, dark landscape before them, there stretched dazzling beams of light, curving and twisting smoothly towards the dusky ceiling high above. As they swept close to one of these beams, they discovered that it was a sort of pipe, seemingly made of crystal, through which flowed pure, sparkling, deliciously clear and bubbling water, upwards. Jane and Jason exchanged amazed glances, the light reflecting off their faces and fading slowly as they moved on past the pipe. Alamar seemed to read their thoughts. You are now viewing the reason why my people exist, our purpose in life. It is a secret that few men on the surface have ever known or understood. What we just passed was the heart and soul of a spring, which bubbles up into the world above and gives life and well-being to the creatures and plants around it. Our duty is to create and maintain these pipes, so that the thirsty world above us does not grow dry. Jane had been gazing back in wonder at that first pipe as it faded in the distance. But now she heard a clanging noise up ahead that drew her attention elsewhere. The pipes were becoming more numerous, and as they drew close to another one, they saw that several groups of Luminorn were hovering around it. They were in groups of two or four, and moved in unison with platforms fastened on their collective backs. These platforms were piled with tools and machines, and men in simple garments strode back and forth amongst the equipment, busying themselves with the pipe. At each corner of the platforms, men stood holding the reins and steering the Luminorn around as the workers commanded. 
Jane now saw the source of the clanging noise. Several of the workers wielded massive hammers, with which, like blacksmiths, they pounded the glistening pipe, shaping and guiding it into smooth curves. Their muscles bulged as they swung the hammers over their heads again and again, their long, fair hair flying around their faces, and their brows beating with sweat as they threw all their strength into each blow. Sizzling, blinding sparks flew as the hammer struck, but the material did not shatter, and Jane realized that this was no ordinary crystal or glass. It was something far stronger and more beautiful. The swift Luminorn soon carried the royal guard and their guests beyond this construction site, but there are many more opportunities to see such wonders as they journeyed on th through the Fountain Kingdom. Finally, after perhaps an hour of traveling, Jane looked over Alamar's shoulder and beheld the grandest sight of them all. Behold Agera, the great spring city, Alamar said with pride. In the distance there spread a brilliant city, dazzling in the glow of the many great pipes that wove their sparkling coals throughout it. The buildings, built within the twisting and turning of the pipes, were tall, magnificent structures of marble, with sharp, imposing spires. In the center of the city rose a tower of crystal and silver that surpassed all the rest in height and beauty, and seemed to nearly touch the dark earth and sky. It was toward this tower that they now steered the Luminorn. Yonder is the palace of His Majesty, King Kalama III. It is time for your interview. Within an hour's time, Jane, Jason, Ezra, and Rossley, with Captain Alomar and two other guards in front, and Kalon poised on Rocky's back following quietly behind, were walking down the center of a long, magnificent, silent hall between tall columns of glass. The columns were filled with water which teemed with tiny, iridescent fish of all colors. Between every other column stood a silver, seven-pronged candelabrum. The dancing flames of the candles threw many curious lights against the columns. At the far end of the hall stood the dais, bearing a great ebony throne. Seated on this throne, in striking contrast to it, was a man in white robes, with a crystal and silver crown upon his head, and long, graying hair and beard. On either side of him stood a guard dressed like Alomar, but these guards wore helmets that completely hid their faces, and they stood so rigid that they could have passed as statues. Four candelabra, like the ones that ranged the hall, were arranged on the dais as well. The king sat still, watching them during their entire long walk through the deafeningly quiet hall. At last, they reached the first steps of the dais and stopped. He lifted his silver scepter, and they climbed the steps and stood before him. He leaned forward, looking them over. His deeply blue, almost purple eyes were very keen, and his expression stern and intelligent. After a long moment of observing them, he spoke. Captain Alomar, when you sent me word that we had received distinguished guests in our lands, I was expecting a group much more impressive than this one. Alomar bent his head in acknowledgment as the king scrutinized them a moment longer. They are mere children. Identify them and then be gone. I have much on my agenda today. The three older guests looked at the king steadily, but Rossley frowned. The king caught the expression and smiled slightly. Do you have an objection to my analysis, young one? he asked. Prince Rossley lifted his chin, looking remarkably like Ezra. You judge too quickly, my lord, he said sturdily. The king's smile widened a bit, and the corner of his eyes creased. Do I now? Peace, Rossley, Ezra began. The king held up his hand. Let the boy speak. How have I misjudged you, bold one? Rossley, respectful but undaunted, lifted his eyes to the king's. I only think that your majesty should give us a chance. Surely you are wise and experienced enough to know that looks can be deceiving. Captain Alomar couldn't restrain himself from looking round at Rossley in astonishment, but the king ignored him, his eyes fastened on Rossley. There was another long pause. "'You are right, child,' the king said softly. "'I quite agree. Well said for one so young.' He raised his voice, straightening in his chair and turning his eyes to Jason. "'Young man, I am told that you are the leader of this band. Tell me your story and show me this sword which you carry. And, most importantly, tell me how and why you have come into my kingdom.'" Chapter 5 Jason told their story under the scrutiny of the silently listening king. Indeed, the king was so silent, and the guards were so silent, and the other guests were so silent, and the room was so empty that Jason became aware of every tiny noise in the hall apart from his own seemingly monotonous voice, and to sense the smallest details that wouldn't normally be obvious. They were surrounded by the trickling, bubbly sounds of the aquarium columns. Jason seemed to hear the soft bumps and brushes of the fish against the glassy walls. Once, he heard Rocky give a great yawn and scratch himself. Alomar's male shirt jingled faintly as he shifted his weight from one foot to another. The candles gave off a mild, sweet scent. The light in the room was constantly, gently moving. 
King Calama's eyes seemed so very keen, and they never once turned away from Jason. Had they even blinked during the whole story? Jason tried not to think about it, and hurried on, making sure to remain as respectful as possible. The blasted story seemed to get longer every time he told it. Would it ever end? He heard his voice falter on a difficult word. Focus. At last he finished, bringing the whole account to a close by telling how he and his friends had found the ancient underground road. And now, Your Majesty, we stand before you, thanks to the hospitality of Captain Alomar. I can tell he serves you well. He was very cautious at the start, and wouldn't have allowed us to go any further if he hadn't been sure that we were friends, not foes. Friends? King Calama asked, raising his eyebrows and sitting back in his throne. Did Captain Alomar call you friends? Jason's stomach tightened, and he glanced at Alomar, whose expression was alert. No, no, sir, he hastened to say. I only meant... You meant that, to us, you pose no threat. And you also meant that you wish to be friends. Yes, sir, Jason pulled himself back together quickly. This did not seem like a good time to ask his next question, but he forced himself to ignore his discomfort and squared his shoulders, feeling that it was his only choice. Um, after hearing my story, you must understand why I would go so far as to ask you, now, to consider joining our alliance. I know that I'm only a kid, and that we're a small force so far. That's why we need you, and every other tribe that we can persuade, to join us in overthrowing the Terrafungs and liberating the Kingdom of Griffin Green. Would you join us, King Kalama? The king looked at him musingly, slowly turning his scepter round between his thumb and forefinger. You say that you need us, and every other tribe that you can persuade, eh? Yes. Did you call us a tribe, boy? Did your flight through our great lands teach you nothing? We are not a tribe, but a kingdom. We owe no favors to Griffin Green. We have had nothing to do with its politics, and very little to do with its people, for generations upon generations. Tell me, why would I send my warriors away from their homes and families in this rich and peaceful realm, up to fight and die for a cause that is not theirs, under a foreign sky? Jason felt sick. Why, indeed? But... Your Majesty, the Terrafung forces horribly outnumber us right now. Your, your aid could possibly turn the tide. The king sighed and stood up. I still have not heard sound reasoning as to why we should join you and what we would possibly gain from it. Until you can give me that, and I doubt you will, I can give you no such aid. He turned to the two royal guards next to Alamar. Escort our guests to the quarters I have prepared for them. Give them a substantial meal and let them rest. They have journeyed far and have had no sleep all night. Captain, you remain with me. He looked back to Jason. I will return you to the upper world tomorrow. In the meantime, consider carefully what I have said to you. We will meet later today, and I will give you one more chance to prove your cause worthy of my people's aid. With that, King Calama III brought his scepter down upon the dais. The interview was over. When Jason and the rest had left the hall, Captain Alomar, in obedience to the king, remained standing before him. You look troubled, Captain, the king said after a while as he leaned back in his chair, still turning his scepter thoughtfully. I suppose I am, my lord, Alamar said quietly. And why? Alamar looked back at the door where Jason and the rest of the company had disappeared. They seemed in earnest. With all due respect, I cannot understand why you do not wish to help them. They may be genuine, yes, but they are not important to me. What have we to do with Griffin Green? Nothing. We have one responsibility, Alamar, and that is to run and maintain the springs. That is how we assist the beings on the surface, by giving them water. But, my lord, I have always believed our responsibility also creates an undeniable link between us and the surface lands. Is it not our duty to help them when they call for aid? No. The political status of our works recipients is irrelevant. Their wars, over matters of which we are not well informed, are not for us to influence. I know, Captain, he said, holding his hand up as Alamar tried to speak, that you feel differently. I have observed the interest that you take in the surface lands. It is not unusual for a man of your age to do so. I know I did when I was a youth. But you will soon learn the wisdom of minding this kingdom's business and its business only. We have much to do, and women and children of our own to protect. No, I want nothing to do with Griffin Green. Here we change scenes. The guests were led out of the palace across a slender, high catwalk to a tall, elegant building opposite the palace. They walked up many flights of steps and came to spacious, adjoining apartments that had been prepared for their arrival. 
There the guards left them, saying that Emile was waiting for them inside. It was very quiet, and there seemed to be no servants around. As tired as they were, they couldn't resist walking through all the different rooms, which were stately and airy, with many windows, a balcony, and rich, comfortable furniture. The dining room's large table was spread with a delicious feast, platters of fruits, cheeses, meats, and pastries, and flagons of fine wine. They ate a hearty breakfast, for it was indeed morning by now, and then dragged themselves tiredly to bed. But as exhausted as Jason was, he had trouble getting to sleep. The king's questions weighed heavily on his mind, and his own inability to answer them weighed even heavier. He tossed and turned in his soft, thickly blanketed bed, staring at the dying embers in the fireplace. He dozed off some, but his troubles soon woke him again. Giving up, he got dressed and wandered from his room, through the sitting room, and out onto the balcony. There, in the cool air, it was, in fact, surprisingly cool considering that they were so far underground, he leaned an elbow on the marble railing, gazing at the orderly foot traffic below him and the graceful luminorm bearing their masters this way and that. The whole scene was well illuminated by the many lamps and gleaming pipes throughout the city, so that he almost forgot that this kingdom was hidden far away from the sun, moon, and stars. He had been there a long time, quieting his mind, when he heard the balcony door open behind him. Jason, Jane said. I'm all right, he said, turning. What is it? Nothing. I had a good rest, but too much has happened for me to sleep very long. Yeah, same here. She joined him at the balustrade. This place is incredible, isn't it? Yes, it is. Jane sighed, and they were silent for a while. Then she spoke up again. Jason, I've noticed something over the past day. What's that? You've changed. Jason looked up, surprised. How do you mean? Well, you've made more decisions, practically split-second decisions, in the past day or two than I ever remember you making before, and you haven't seemed worried about it either. It's, well, it's pretty impressive. Jason grinned wryly. I'm glad you're impressed because I'm just scared. Scared? Why? I'm not used to doing all this. I'm trying to get better at it, like Theron told me, but now I've gotten us into a bad spot and I don't know what to do about it. What makes you say we're in a bad spot? King Calamus said we could go home tomorrow, and we've gotten to see this kingdom. I think it was worth the trip. Jason shook his head grimly. He says we'll go home tomorrow. But Alamar also said that few men above the surface have ever known the secret of this kingdom. What makes you so sure that the king, who doesn't seem to like our mission very much, will let us return to the surface carrying that secret? Jane swallowed. I didn't think of that. Jason turned back to look at the scenery before them. I don't mean to worry you. I just want to warn you. Maybe he will let us go as he promised. But even then, for the rest of our days here in Griffin Green, I will know with every drop of blood shed that I failed to bring us the help that could have saved us. Don't think like that, Jason. You didn't fail. Maybe we'll think of something to convince him. But even if we can't change the king's mind, it won't be your fault. He has a fairly good point about keeping the kingdom separate, and just because you can't refute that doesn't make you a bad leader. Now, come on, let's go back inside. The others will wake up soon. Jason followed her indoors, and they each went back to their own rooms to rest for a while longer. Outside, the hum of the Luminorn intensified as the morning progressed and the traffic increased. When they joined the others in the sitting room, Jason looked around. I guess we should have a quick meeting and try to figure out what we should say to the king. Ezra? He stopped and looked around. Where is he? Rossi cleared his throat. <clears throat> he left a little while ago, while we were all still resting. I saw him. Left, Jason said in astonishment. Where did he go? I think, Rossley said hesitantly, that he went to see King Kalama. Chapter 6 And he comes alone, does he? King Kalama said, mildly curious. Send him in. The servant padded away, disappearing into a side door. All was quiet for the space of two minutes. Then the great door at the other end of the hall opened. A figure stepped through and stood still for a moment before beginning the long, slow walk down the length of the hall. As he drew closer, King Kalama could see that it was, indeed, Prince Ezra. The young man was deliberate in his bearing, though respectful as he approached him. His cape flapped softly behind him as he strode along with his hand resting naturally on his sword hilt. When he reached the foot of the dais, he bowed low. The king lifted his scepter. "'Come up, young prince,' he said." Ezra climbed the steps and stood before the king, who beckoned a servant forward bearing a tray with several goblets and a decanter. "'Will you take some refreshment?' the king asked as the servant filled two goblets. "'Thank you, sire.' 
The prince waited until the king had taken up a goblet before doing the same. King Calama noticed his observance of court etiquette and concluded that the boy must be from one of the more civilized surface tribes. Tell me, have you enjoyed your visit in my lands? He asked after taking a sip. You reign over a marvelous kingdom, your highness, Ezra replied. Aye, but you do not answer my question. The king shot a keen glance at the prince's face. Ezra looked at him steadily. Truthfully, I have not been able to enjoy my visit in your lands. And why is that? The king demanded. But wait, I know why. You are displeased with my refusal to assist the rebellion on the surface. Ezra bent his head in acknowledgment. I am greatly troubled, my lord, he said gravely. King Calama frowned. You fail to understand that I have a people to protect, he said sternly. Prince Ezra's head snapped up. You fail to understand, your majesty, that I do as well, he returned, his eyes flashing. The king stared at him in the pause that followed, but Ezra was not daunted. Ever since I entered this land, I have been tormented by the sight of these countless springs under your care. The abundance of fresh water burns like fire in my mind because my people have none. In my hamlet, they dole out minuscule water portions to each family, old water, from barrels that are bought with the blood of our warriors, month after month, because our abominable enemies have cut off the stream around which our ancestors built our home. He put down his goblet, from which he had not drunk a drop, as if he scorned it. I had to face the fact that nothing could be done, that the Terrafungs had beaten us by hijacking nature itself, and now I find that all along there was an intelligent force controlling the springs from below, a force that could have rescued us from our plight at will. Tell me, King Kalama, is it not tragic that you, of all people, would refuse aid to those who wish to cast off the yoke of such a vile enemy, which tries to destroy a whole tribe with thirst? Women, children, sick and old notwithstanding. You, the king of the Fountain Kingdom. King Kalama had started forward in his throne and was gripping its arms tightly. Halt, he snapped. You say they have damned your water source? It is but a dusty crack in the ground now. Our enemies wish to break us, to force us into a miserable subservience through illness and squalor, and open our gates to their plundering. They are well on their way to succeeding. The king was on his feet, pacing back and forth on the dais. Prince Ezra stood watching him. Did you not know? How could you not know if our springs are really in your kingdom's charge, as you say? The prince demanded. The king spun around to face Ezra. Hold your tongue, boy, he began, but stopped himself. He turned away again, hand to his chin, deep in thought, and resumed pacing. I do not take lightly those who dare to disturb the natural flow of my springs, he said at last, even less when I inexplicably was told nothing about it. It smacks of corruption, your highness, Ezra said boldly. Perhaps it does, the king said musingly. I cannot let this go unaddressed. I do not wish to be caught up in a war, but I also will not allow innocent people to die of thirst. Furthermore, if these terrifunks have truly somehow infiltrated my bureaucracy, they have acted against my kingdom itself. Well then... What will you do about it? I will send a scout to your hamlet to assess your plight. Someone discreet and trustworthy, who will not get your people's hopes up prematurely, and who will be able to report back to me on what needs to be done. Mind you, I still will not establish a war alliance with this rebellion, but this action by the Terrafungs is uncalled for, and the issue of the spring must be rectified. Will you accept this offer? Ezra studied the king's face for a moment. What do you ask in return? The Fountain Kingdom needs nothing from those on the surface, the king said proudly. We on the surface do not simply accept favors without paying for them, the prince returned firmly. This is no favor. This is duty, and the Fountain Kingdom righting the wrongs against its territory. Now, will you or will you not accept my offer? He offered his right hand. Finally, Prince Ezra grasped the king's hand. Yes. Send your scout. I will send word privately to my father, King Terran. That evening, the king kept his word. He sent Jason and his friends back up to the surface. When they met with him before leaving, Jason, who had learned from Ezra what the king planned to do for the Ingers, did not push the issue of allying with his rebellion. He only informed the king once again that they would be grateful for his assistance if he ever changed his mind. Inwardly, he was hopeful. For now, perhaps, the Ingers would not suffer, and he knew that once the king was involved in any way, the chances of him joining the alliance were greater. They climbed onto the Luminorum with Captain Alomar once again, and he showed them many wonders on the journey back to the surface. But this is not the time or place to reveal the mysteries of the deep. Suffice it to say that the travelers would never forget their time in the Fountain Kingdom. 
They were taking a different route this time, for Alamar claimed that he could get them closer to Hosterdam than they had been when they entered his land. They reached a tunnel, similar to the one through which they had come, and walked up its long, sloping length until they came to a round door fixed in the earth above their heads. Alamar unlocked it and threw it open. The other royal guards, who were part of the escort, boosted the captain, Jason, and his friends through the opening. They were in the ancient underground roads of the Wise Ones once again. Alamar led them silently along the passages. He seemed to know the way quite well. After a little while, he spoke. I am glad that you entered our lands, he said quietly. So am I, Jason said. I only wish that I could have left knowing that we had your alliance. Alamar looked steadily ahead. My king knows what is best for our people, he said, but his tone did not match his words. They continued in silence, finally reaching a flight of steps. The cold air wafting down on them had the sharp, crisp, and strangely foreign feel of the surface world. The travelers had only been in the Fountain Kingdom for a little while, yet that upper air seemed to be but an old, nearly forgotten memory. Alamar pulled his cape tighter around his shoulders and turned to face his guests. This is your exit. It is now time for us to part. He bowed deeply. The travelers did the same, and Jason shook his hand warmly. Farewell, Captain. Thank you for your help. Ezra also shook the captain's hand. Until we meet again, he said. Alamar saluted, and with that, the gleaming warrior turned away. His black cape immediately masked the brightness of his uniform and armor, and the lone figure disappeared like a shadow down the passage. Jason turned to the stairway. Well, it's time to go home. Feeling quite tired, they climbed the narrow flight, the air growing cooler and crisper all the time. They reached a little room with a trap door in the ceiling, almost identical to the one which they had first discovered. Jason reached for the chain. Wait, Jane said suddenly. How will we ever find these underground roads again? We really found them by accident. Nothing happens by accident, Kalon said firmly. And do not worry. I know how to find the way back. Jason pulled the chain. With a rusty groan, the latch slid back, and the trapdoor slowly and with some resistance opened. Sticks, leaves, and earth, cold and wet, rained down on his head and shoulders. One by one, boosting each other up, they clambered into the world above them. Jason was the last to go. He looked around the room with its ancient engravings and seemed to hear Theram's voice in his head, a memory returning to him from those first days in Griffin Green. Do not take lightly the history of Griffin Green. Even the old legends may become of great importance to you. Things long hidden from the ancient days may help you. Was this what the Griffin meant? And had he, the leader of the rebellion, failed to secure the help that was supposed to save them? He closed his eyes and drew a deep breath, shutting out the thought. Jason, Ezra called, are you coming? Jason turned and grasped the chain, pulling himself upwards, hand over hand. When he got close enough, Ezra reached down and grabbed his arm, while Rosley and Jane held the trap door open as best they could. Jason was dragged up through the opening, and the door clanged shut. Something white and cold touched Jason's face. He rolled onto his back and looked up. It was snowing. There was already a significant dusting on the ground. He looked at Ezra, whose expression was grim. Winter is upon us, the prince said. Jason nodded and got wearily to his feet. Our job just got a lot harder.